I'm going to talk about two women separated by a century, Caroline Lady Denison and Margaret Lady Wakehurst. Caroline Denison and her husband, Sir William Denison, the 11th governor of New South Wales, arrived in Sydney on the 17th of January, 1855. She was 36, mother of nine and pregnant. She also brought with her eight years of Antipodean viceregal experience, just gained while consort in Van Diemen's land since 1847. She was born Caroline Lucy Hornby in Lancashire in 1818, the second of five daughters of Captain, later Admiral Sir Phipps Hornby and his wife Maria Sophia. And she was also the niece of the 13th Earl of Derby. In January 1838, her father was appointed superintendent of Her Majesty's Dockyard at Woolwich, where it seems likely that Caroline first met William Denison a Royal Engineer educated at Eton and Royal Military Academy and seconded by, to the Admiralty in the dockyards at Woolwich and Portsmouth. Caroline Hornby and William Denison married at Woolwich in November 1838 with the groom's brother Edward, the Lord Bishop of Salisbury officiating. In June 1846, Denison was appointed Lieutenant Governor of Van Diemen's Land and knighted the following August. The Denisons arrived in Hobart Town on the 25th of January, 1847, and by then it was a family of seven. Caroline, who was called Lena by her family and friends, had given birth to five children, three daughters and two sons, all born and baptised in Woolwich. Denison's instructions from Britain were not popular, especially the continuance of convict transportation. The viceregal couple embraced the social life of the colony, but seemingly were unaware of the social conventions of a penal settlement, and their dinner invitations to former convicts offended local sensitivities. The couple was considered aloof. Caroline Denison's manner described as cold and stiff. However, the viceregal consort was in turn rather amused by the pretensions of the so-called respectable residents who jostle for precedence at functions. In her journals, Caroline recorded her unwitting faux pas, her activities, strong political opinions described the flora and fauna and noted her husband's health. He suffered uh, from epileptic seizures and his unpopularity. For much of the Denison's lengthy term, the couple anticipated a dispatch notifying his recall. They were devoted parents who played games with their children, took them fishing and on picnics. But a great concern was the well-being of the colony's children. Caroline played an active role as patron of the Infant School Society and at the Queen's Orphan School where she found the children unnaturally quiet and orderly. Denison considered the boys were depressed into stupidity by cold and harsh treatment and advocated the teachings of skills to equip them for employment and he appointed sympathetic teachers. For the school children of Hobart Town, Lady Denison introduced a Christmas tree and a juvenile ball at Government House, a decorating room and purchasing hundreds of small gifts for the young guests. Denison was also dismayed by the plight of the Aboriginal population exiled on Flinders Island and in an unpopular move, he resettled them at Oyster Cove, south of Hobart. On Christmas Day, 1847, the Denison's dinner guests at the government cottage at New Norfolk were the farms, labourers and their families, and a party of Aborigines from Oyster Cove. The latter, a few evenings later, were lent the vice-regal box at the theatre must have raised a few eyebrows. Several groups of Aborigines were received by Caroline Denison at Government House. She wrote of the quote, poor blacks, the only atonement which we, their conquerors, can make for all the wrongs done them is to make them as comfortable and happy as we can in their own way. Lady Denison established a home for prostitutes and continued her charitable activities during another four pregnancies another two sons and two daughters. Tasmanian his historian Alison Alexander 
wrote that Lady Denison's public activities gradually reduced to those of a conventional nature. This decline could be attributed perhaps to her increasing family responsibilities or just meeting society expectation. After eight years in the colony, a month before their departure for Sydney, Lady Denison remarked, it is really a pleasant thing to go out amongst the people here now. There is a kindly feeling, as if people were really sorry to lose us. The governor had gained some popularity as a result of improved public works and services, and probably not least the end of transportation to VDL, Van Diemen's Land. In Sydney, Government House had not been designed to accommodate a large family and the requisite household staff. Dedison directed that upstairs rooms in a service wing were to be finished, the servants' hall was to be extended, and a laundry and wash house were to be constructed. Since the time of Macquarie, the laundry had been sent to the laundress, Mrs. Abel, at Old Government House, Parramatta. The state rooms were refurbished with chandeliers, soft furnishings and furniture, including the suite of cedar furniture for the dining room by Andrew Lenahan, which is still in regular use, and of course, any of us who have visited will have uh, seen it. Mrs. Jane Barker, wife of the Reverend Frederick, thought Lady Denison was, quote, very amiable and sensible, very domestic and fond of her children and husband, and she brought up her family well. Barker added, it could not be said that she was popular in her manner and attributed it to a certain simplicity and unworldliness. She cynically remarked, a more decided woman of fashion or leader in that line would be more suitable to the Sydney taste. The deeply religious spice regal couple soon restored the moral tone and social standing of Government House. The Freeman's Journal, commenting on the select guest list for the Queen's birthday ball, noted there would be none of the nondescript specimens who attended when Fitzroy and his sons were in residence and the house had been likened to a bordello. The vice-regal couple paid numerous visits to the National School and Lady Denison took an interest in the female school of industry, Carol, at Parramatta, she was horrified by the dirt, the neglect and the wretchedness of the Protestant Orphan School. The Catholic Orphanage was just slightly an improvement. She also found conditions at the Destitute Children's Asylum at Paddington utterly repulsive. That was when it was in Juniper Hall. She confessed, quote, visiting there is the most painful of all my out of door duties. Denison laid the foundation stone for a new asylum at Randwick in 1856. Lady Denison established a Sunday school at Government House, which is more, more educational than religious, uh, that what we know now. She eschewed public opinion and supported the Sydney Female Refuge Society and its work with prostitutes. Lady Denison also introduced a Christmas and a party at Government House for Sydney school children. And that seems to have been the beginning of a tradition. I don't know if all of the consorts uh, had held the party, but Admiral and Mrs Sinclair in the 1990s held a Christmas party for disadvantaged children at Government House. And one year, Mrs Sinclair actually moved the party to Moree in the south, northwest of the state. The Denisons found time to take their children to pantomimes and picnics, and they often crossed the harbour by ferry with their horses to ride on the North Shore. With Denison's powers diminished by a responsible government in 1856, he travelled extensively, largely inspecting engineering works, sometimes accompanied by his two elder daughters, Mary and Susan. <coughs> The family dynamic changed during the Denison's time in New South Wales. The two eldest sons, William and Frank, were sent home to be educated at Eton and were kept up to date by frequent lengthy, lengthy letters from parents and siblings. Caroline gave birth to four more sons and tragedy struck the family in the second half of 1858 when daughter Ellen Matilda, aged six, died in September 
of a dangerous form of sore throat that, quote, sounds like diphtheria to me, followed in October by three-year-old Charles. The children were buried at Camperdown Cemetery. The correspondence, this lengthy correspondence between the parents and siblings survives and is in, held in England, one in an institution, other by family. They both on, have been uh, on, copied on the Australian Joint Copying Project, which of course is now being digitised by the National Library, so you can find them under National Library, under Trove and the manuscripts. Uh, it's very lengthy. On the 22nd of January 1861, the Denisons left Sydney for Sir William to take up his appointment as Governor of the Madras Presidency, which is now Tamil Nadu. Published extracts of Lady Denison's journals describe her viceregal activities there, including the Tamil language in order to converse with the inhabitants and opening a school for the children of their local servants. Following the death of Lord Elgin in December 1863, Denison briefly served as Governor General of India with Caroline as Vice Reign. In September 1865, she gave birth to their 14th child, a daughter, Catherine Mary, who has been overlooked by Denison historians and biographers, including the ADB. She was still alive in 1901, census. The Denisons left Madras at the end of at March 1866. Caroline had served 19 years as a viceregal consort. It was said she found it difficult to adjust to life in England and after her long service, still expected everyone to stand up when she entered the Boxer Opera. Sir William died on the 19th of January, 1871 at his home in Surrey. He'd gone skating on the pond with the children, fell through the ice, caught cold and died of pneumonia. The previous year, he had published his two volume varieties of Ice Regal Life. Some historians and readers tend not to appreciate that the majority of the most interesting text is actually extracts from Lady Denison's journals. Lady Denison died on the 24th of July, 1899, at her daughter Susan's home in Westmoreland. For Sydney Siders, a permanent reminder of Caroline Denison is the Hornby Light at the entrance to Sydney Harbour, designed by Sir William Denison and named by him for her naval family. Now jumping a century to Margaret, Lady Wakehurst. Margaret, Lady Wakehurst, was born on the 4th of November at Peeblesheer, Scotland, to a wealthy industrialist, Sir Ch Baronet Sir Charles Tennant, and his second wife, Marguerite. She was Tennant's 13th child and the first of four of his second marriage. Among her renegade half-sisters was the notorious Margot, married to the future Prime Minister, Herbert Henry Asquith. Pe Margaret, who was known as Peggy throughout her life, saw little of her parents and was raised by a nanny. Her parents were golf fanatics. Her next sister died young and the age gap between Peggy and her two other sisters resulted in a lonely childhood. Following the death of her father in 1906, properties including a London townhouse, 31 Lennox Gardens, passed to her mother while Peggy and her sisters each received a substantial trust fund. Their mother subsequently remarried and had two sons who were loved by her daughters. Completing her education in 1918, Peggy was presented at court and during the London season was introduced to 25-year-old Gallipoli and Middle East veteran, Captain John de Vere Loder. Financially independent, thanks largely to his uncle's racing tips and disinclined to society life, Loder worked in the foreign office. He introduced Peggy to the world of classical music and opera and shared her passion for golf. By late 1919, she had accepted his marriage proposal. His parents, Gerald and Lady Louise Loder, she was a daughter of a duke, were unenthusiastic. Lady Louise did not want her son to marry into trade. The vast tenant empire 
had begun with the manufacture of bleaching powder. The couple married in June, nevertheless, and moved into 31 Lenox Gardens, a wedding gift from her mother. In September 1923, the couple embarked on an eight-month world tour, leaving baby Henrietta with the family. Keen to mix with ordinary people, the loaders travelled modestly. In Panama, they missed a connection, so they joined a tramp steamer bound for Australia. Landing in Brisbane, their enthusiasm for the country and its people grew as they visited the eastern capitals, crossed the Nullarbor with frequent stops, and then sailed from Perth to Darwin and on to Asia. They had probably seen more of Australia than most Australians at that time. Loder served as a member of parliament between 1924 and April 1936, when he succeeded to his father's recent title, becoming second Baron Wakehurst and entering the House of Lords. That Christmas, soon after the abdication of Edward VIII, Lord Wakehurst was offered the post of Governor of New South Wales. The former incumbent, Sir Murray Anderson, had died suddenly and a vice regal presence was essential for the coronation celebrations for George VI and Queen Elizabeth in the following May. Now with four children, the Wakers thought it would be, quote, a wonderful experience for everybody. Lady recollected, John and I were quite nervous at the prospect because we had never been in a government house in our lives and we knew that the governor's job was quite different to the political one of being an MP. The governor's wife had to be so many negative things, non-political, non-sectarian, non-gossipy and non-personal, all of which I had rather been the opposite. The Wakehursts arrived in April 1937 and were immediately immersed in coronation celebration preparations. Daughter Henrietta, 15, remained at school in England. Two sons, Christopher and David, 12 and 9, boarded at Tudor House, a school at Mossvale, not far from Hillview. Robert, age three, and his nanny lived at Government House. And Lady Wakehurst, not forgetting her solitary childhood, had them take their meals at a separate table in the main dining room, and she held children's parties for him to meet other children. The press described Lady Wakehurst as tall, elegant, well-defined features, brown hair, a light olive tone of complexion, rather than the conventional peaches and cream usually attributed to the English woman. And she had large, brown, expressive eyes. Lady Wakers later recalled, at first I minded terribly the criticism about my accent or what I said or what I wore. And she found Lady Gowrie, wife of the Governor General, a great help and mentor. She wrote to her mother, life is a round of visits to hospitals, opening coronation avenues and schools and visits from different people about different charities. She had also visited slums with the city mission and when inspecting day nurseries and kindergartens, often took young Robert with her. However, there were events she preferred to avoid. I have had a pretty grim week. Reception at two women's clubs, about 250 at each. Purely social, which is very boring. Elderly ladies wrapped in expensive furs burr, bear down upon me in their dozens. I don't propose to do many more of that sort. In late 1937, upon the arrival of her mother and daughter from England, Lady Wakers booked herself into a private hospital for a week's rest, leaving her mother to deputise. 1938 would be even busier with Australia's cess with centenary celebrations, the Empire Games and an international women's conference. Expecting a full house of interstate vice-regal guests, descriptions in the press of the dilapidated four first floor apartments with their sagging beds and chamber pots underneath and the appalling servants quarters embarrassed the government into extensive renovations. In a 1980s ABC interview, Lady Wakers said she had never forgotten the week of sesquicentenary celebrations and that the fireworks were quote, out of this world. The Wakers enjoyed their extensive outback tours by rail and road at each township where they held a reception, 
the governor donned his full dress uniform and Lady Wakers wore her tiara, best dress and long white gloves. She said, we had put on everything as if going to the palace and I was touched at what that link meant to them. Since her first Australian visit, she had never ceased to be amazed by the courage of women living in great isolation and developed a great admiration for the members of the Country Women's Association. The family enjoyed their breaks at Hillview. She said we could wear old clothes and relax and swim in local creeks and pools. We used to have lovely picnics in the evenings, motoring quite a long way, then doing barbecues. John and the boys would make the fire and grill the chops and make tea in a billy can. Government House book uh, has some wonderful images of the Wakehurst domestic staff at Hillview. Um, they were presented uh, by the descendant of uh, Robert's nanny, uh, Nurse Timms. Peggy regretted her role did not allow forming close friendships. Her only truly close friend was Mary Tennyson Woods, a solicitor and social worker. She, but she especially admired Jessie Street and Persia Porter of the Australian Red Cross, who some of you may know as late, have known as Lady Galligan. When war was declared in September 1939, the Wakehurst elected to remain at Government House, where the cellar was reinforced to make an effective raid, air raid shelter. Lord Wakehurst's five-year term was extended in 1942, and because of the war, the couple were not permitted to leave the state and were unable to visit their son, David, who had gone to school in Melbourne. Christopher Train, the oldest one, trained with the Royal Australian Navy to serve in the Pacific, while Henrietta, who had studied social work at the University of Sydney, was working at military hospital and with the Red Cross. And Waker's relatives were all prisoners, uh, several of them were prisoners of war. So it was just as anxious time for them personally. Lady Wakehurst as patron and working president of the New South Wales Division of the Australian Red Cross Society and commander in chief of its thousand member strong voluntary aid detachment, packed boxes for soldiers, launched appeals for sick and incapacitated servicemen, led or took the salute at numerous parades and worked on stalls and knitted socks. In June, 1940, both levels of the Sydney Town Hall were packed by women responding to her proposal to form the Women's Australian National Service, known as the WANS, aimed to coordinate the activities of present and future groups. Thousands of women joined and were offered training for all manner of non-military work and a special uniform was issued and worn almost daily by Lady Wakehurst. The organisation spread to country towns and together with the CWA and the Women's Land Army made an extraordinary contribution to the war effort. As President and Commander-in-Chief, Lady Wakers said she derived enormous satisfaction from its effectiveness and later said that it was the making of her. In 1945, the Wakers were granted permission to leave the state to accompany General Sir Thomas and Lady Blaney on a tour of the Australian troops in the islands north of Australia. Lady Wakers and Lady Blamey visited hospitals at forward bases within the sound of Japanese guns, quote, agonizing over the very youthful Aussie soldiers too ill to survive. The Wakers left for England in June, 1945. Lady Wakers reflected, for John and me personally, being in Australia was certainly one of the most important experiences of our lives. Among Lady Waker's farewell gifts was a diamond watch and brooch for which 900 pound was subscribed by 18,000 members of 180 women's associations with no individual permitted to subscribe more than two shillings. The return home was dramatic, especially the site of bomb damaged London they had nowhere to live. Their home, 30, 31 Lennox Gardens, was still occupied by the government. The warehouse in which their furniture was stored had been destroyed by bombs and their luggage had been stolen from a wharf in Auckland. Lord Wakehurst 
was offered the second governorship, this time of Northern Ireland, and he served there from 1952 until 1964. Lady Wakehurst was involved in the creation of the Royal College of Nursing in Belfast and initiated the formation of the non-sectarian Northern Ireland Mental Health Association in 1959, and it still flourishes. Lady Wakehurst was awarded numerous honours and was created a Dame of the British Empire in 1964 in the recognition of her work. From 1958 to 78, she served as Vice President of the Royal College of Nursing in England, and when a, quote, genetic indisposition in Lord Wakehurst's aristocratic lineage affected their son, David, Peggy Wakehurst was one of the four founders of the National Schizophrenia Fellowship in England and served as its president until 1984. Lord Wakehurst died in October 1970. Dame Margaret lived on at 31 Lennox Gardens, still actively involved in cultural and welfare organisations. In the 1980s, as her sight deteriorated, young Australian and New Zealand women lived in as companion and cook. She said she found them much more interesting and energetic than English girls. Dame Margaret Wakehurst died on the 19th of August, 1994, survived by her daughter and three sons. She is commemorated in New South Wales by the scenic Lady Wakehurst Drive in the Royal National Park south of Sydney. And what happened next? Lord Wakehurst had been the last British governor of New South Wales. William McKell, the Labour Premier of New South Wales, had informed the British authorities that the next governor of the state would be Australian born. Britain was unwilling to lose its autonomy and had rejected such proposals since the 1920s but eventually reluctantly proposed measures that would allow the state some participation in the selection of its governor. Instead, McKell just forwarded a single nomination of Lieutenant General John Northcott. It received royal approval and New South Wales had the changing of the guard. As the Vice Regal Consort's book could only include brief entries for each consort, the State Library of New South Wales, at the suggestion of the Royal, commissioned oral histories with surviving Australian-born consorts, descendants, and an official secretary for additional, additional information on their experiences and to form a permanent record. These are available through the library's catalogue. From these and the book, it is clearly evident that New South Wales has been well served by all of its dedicated vice-regal consorts who truly played the part. Thank you.